Steve Betts. Tara and I are going to present the semantic web for you this afternoon. Uh, I'm going to start with a little history, and then Tara will take over a little later. Um, as you've seen in previous classes, we have lots and lots of sensors now covering the world. Sensors like traffic sensors, sensors like temperature sensors, we have weather stations, we have smoke detectors, we have red light cameras. Um, all of these things are generating data at a prolific rate, and we don't have any way of uh, understanding all of that data as a whole. The sensors, each of the sensors generate observations, and the observations are in the sensor-specific language. And what we want to do is we want to translate that sensor-specific language into something that we can manipulate and combine with other data. And too often today, sensor data is closed in a standalone system, and it's not available to the public or to researchers in general. And what we want to do is we want to enable a way of sharing that data and combining that data with other systems. And once we do that, we're going to have to figure out how we find all of the data that's available and then how we can access that data so we can use it for whatever purposes we want to use. So how do we find something when there's such a large variety of data to find? There are petabytes of data being generated on a weekly basis now. So one of the things the OGC has developed is sensor web enablement. It's a way of annotating observations such that they can be uh, understood by systems that weren't developed to work particularly with that sensor. <coughs> the, the system enables to the description of the sensors themselves, how the sensors work, what observations the sensors can make, where the, what kind of data they generate, as well as to annotate the data itself to say this is a measurement from a particular kind of sensor, this is a measurement made at a particular time in a particular location. And to do this, there are actually a number of different uh, standards. There are standards for observations themselves. This is observations and measurement. That describes each individual value and how to interpret that value. Then there's sensor markup language, sensor modeling language, excuse me, which is what the sensor is, how the sensor works, what processes the sensor uses, so you can understand whether sensors are alike or different. And then GML <coughs> is where things happen. And GML is one of, this is by far the largest specification of these set of specifications. It can describe almost any geographic or <coughs> geometric um, value. And then this was a new one to me. This used to be um, TML, which was transducer modeling language, and that was for real-time streaming. This has been replaced in the last couple years by Puck, and I, don't, I have read the Puck spec, but it didn't make a lot of sense to me yet, so I need to read it again a few times before it starts making sense. But this is for getting the data directly from sensors. Now, um, uh, any, uh, Google has something called um, uh, physical web. Uh, it is a GitHub thing uh, for, you know, so they are now that earlier we used to talk about a few sensors and worry about how to interact with the sensors. Now with this internet of things, to many many more devices and obviously they are all talking on the internet, right? So mm -hmm. uh, new things are coming up, and um, we ourselves one of our you know my peers student uh, worked on uh, something called semantic gateway. That is more at the data level, but at this kind of level, um, people interested should also look up things <coughs> like Google, uh, Google's uh, physical web uh, protocol. Does that include things that are not uh, physically sensors, but just sort of logically sensors? Do I don't know. know. I, don't I, don't I just know. saw it fleeting yesterday, so I don't okay. know. Okay. So I'm examining this space, but that's all I can tell. So now that we have described our sensor and our sensor data in a way that we can then we have to find it. And so OGC has a catalog service for web. And the catalog service for web actually allows you to search for data sets. And you can search for data sets by the title.
type of data you're looking for, what the sensor measures, uh, the units of measure the sensor uses, so you can always combine like units of measure, or what the application of the data could be, things that are weather related, things that are emergency services related, that kind of stuff. An interesting point here is this registry service only points you at where the data resides. It doesn't actually return any data to you. So it sends, it's a catalog of data sets. So the first step would be query the catalog, <coughs> discover what's available. The second step, depending on what you want to do, would be either to go get the data from a sensor observation service, and that'll actually return you values in large data sets. Or you can, this is my favorite, go plan data collections. Certain sensors have orientation requirements or have uh, uh, shared usage requirements, and so this will let you request that you get some sensor data from a particular orientation. Um, in my practice, a lot of this is satellite orientation, so you can request that these things be, satellites take pictures of certain locations at certain times. And then the sensor alert service, um, this is, so you can say when a phenomenon occurs, when the temperature goes over a certain uh, amount in a particular region, you can be notified. You still have to go and get the data, but at least you'll know the data is available when that happens. And so these products give us the capability of discovering the data. And then the next thing we have to do, which is the hard part, which is <coughs> interpret the data. Because when the data comes out of the services, it looks well, when you graph it, it looks something like this. Everything's got a different axis. Everything's got a different range. So you've <coughs> got to figure out how these things combine. What is the meaning of these things? And that's where the semantic web comes in. So what we're going to do is we're going to work on combining the data together, and then we're going to annotate it to get more meaning out of what the data is. So, to describe what I mean by annotating the data, we use this as an example. We've got low-level sensors that are taking pictures of objects in the street. <coughs> then we have high-level sensors that are taking pictures from a uh, different orientation and different scale. And we want to be able to combine that data to determine whether things that we see are all the same or all different. And so we annotate the data using our SWE. So we have a date time for data. We have a location for data, and then we actually have the values of the things that we see, whether the data is a raster or whether the data is some scalar measurement. And we use this to climb the, the DIKW, which in this instance is the raw sensor data, then feature metadata. Those are lines, edges, color changes, objects, simple things. Then we change to entity metadata, so we can tell in the, this example whether things are cars and whether these things are moving. And then we apply our ontology data to it to make things more sensible. Oh, and I've walked through my next set of slides a little too quickly. But, um, so one of the problems with the sensor data is the lack of interoperability. So we use these measurements. Uh, we have to combine these measurements using these standards to extract our features. we can tell their cars, right? And then we apply them. What kind of cars? Are they going fast? What are their behavior characteristics? Things that we can't do just from the raw data. We can't do anything from a single picture. So do you remember uh, a first slide that I showed? Uh, I had things like uh, S&P 500 and Dow Jones News of Fuel and, um, uh, and uh, Oracle and uh, PeopleSoft and Microsoft in that slide. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, exactly. So that is for text. <coughs> this is for uh, sensors that will give some other kind of data. This is not image. Uh, this is for sensor data. So it be, okay. uh, you know, like weather data or something else, that, uh, seismic, seismic data or whatever. But the, there's still the same analogy, um, that there would be some syntactic data instead of raw sensor data at the bottom level. Mm -hmm. Then here is a feature data. Well, that feature would be some lexical feature, like uh, you know, uh, words and uh, phrase delineation, right? Um, uh, and so you would use uh, techniques like 
<coughs> if you remember the classification techniques I talked about Bayesian and hidden Markov model and um, knowledge. and knowledge base was another one. Uh, all those give are basically features in the way. And then there were NDT. My NDT would be Oracle, Larry Ellison, SMP 500, right? And then there was an ontology which was not on the slide, but it was implied that I had an ontology of all the financial services data. So I had name of all the stocks and which stock exchange they are traded on and who are their CEOs and all that kind of stuff and what, color, what technology, what market they are, this company is in and what are the competitors, all that was an ontology. So the same general, um, you know, uh, levels of these uh, descriptions. Extract it to go for that abstract layer of abstraction. How we are doing it in the case of sensor, like we got the raw data. We are talking about some uh, lexical analysis or something. I couldn't get that feature metadata and the in between metadata part. Uh, the uh, feature metadata. Uh, so so take an example of a road sensor, okay. right? And. Um, uh, there is something that hits the sensor and that is being observed. Mm -hmm. From that to <coughs> say the current car speed, average car speed is 30 miles an hour. Okay. That gets to the NTD level. Okay. Right? So um, take an example of uh, <coughs> uh, a radar image that uh, you know, the weather radar gets. And that um, there is current raining in the uh, downtown of Fairborn mm -hmm. would be there as an entity metadata. The weather ontology would be the ontology where it will say uh, whether some rain is considered to be uh, heavy rain, whether it's considered to be squall, or things of that nature. Right. The example I was thinking of was the the wave sensors out in the Pacific Ocean. Okay. Right. So each sensor is going to de to detect a change in the in the wave height, mm -hmm. and then the combination of sensors together will tell you there's a feature, and the feature would be a, a large wave, say. Okay. But then at the the entity level is whether that wave is large enough to be a tsunami, whether you have oh. to generate warnings. Mm -hmm. What kind of what kind of what direction it's going that kind of thing would be um, the, the higher level ontological thing. I love it. Thank you. Any other questions before we mm -hmm. while we're paused here? So the framework for doing this work, just like it was in the in the textual work or in the movie work, was we have all the sensor data and we start annotating it. We also extract features and objects and then we annotate those as well based on this ontology data, which will be domain specific. And then we have all of that in a large data store and that's where we can do our semantic queries. So we can find out what things are related to which other things, whether whether the temperature going up in a building is related to the weather or whether it's related to a fire. We, we would be able to ask questions like that. Say smoke detectors are going off too, so it's probably not weather related. Right? Mm -hmm. kind of thing. And so, this is an example of the semantic sensor observation service where the sensor observation service has raw observations, but we add capability to those observations, annotation to those observations, so that we can make more sense of it. And we do that from the data collection, we do that through the Spark Query engine in this example. Um, to uh, we when the query comes in, sorry, when the query comes in, we uh, parse the query. We do the entity collection. We look for synonyms, antonyms, other related events. Then we do a query for the data that matches that, and then we return that data. But we first we have to have annotated the data to make it all work.
Okay, now. Okay, now all the sensors are around, so we should be able to. Now all sensors, I think all sensors we have, we should be able to uh, describe the sensors. So what sensors are doing actually? How they measure? How will they measure? And how, let's say, how long the battery is working? How long the battery will last? And uh, what type of data uh, it will report? And this data, what, what is the format of data presentation? So to find these answers, we need ontologists. That's why there are people starting to be ontologists. As you know, Noises is a member of World Wide Web Consortium and uh, initiated a group called uh, Sensor, uh, Semantic Sensor Networking. So two projects founded, one of them is how to define ontology. This is basic ontology definition. This ontology is developed by the World Wide Web Consortium Semantic Sensor Network in Semester Group. This ontology describes, as you can see, uh, sensors and observation and these are the sensors, observation and related concepts. It does not describe domain concepts like lo time, location, etc. These are intended to be included from the other ontology like oil imports. So this is the uh, sensor modeling that um, we have particular here. So we have particular here and a stimulus and sensor observation. A stimulus is related to the sense uh, is related to the particular and sensor produce observation. Also observation act as a uh, stimulus. So you can see from this model pra uh, practic uh, pra particular we can get time, location, symbol. So this is how the uh, symbol is coming to meaningful. This is a sample of uh, ontology. These are things extra, so uh, more uh, in detail. So you can see here we have measuring capability. Measuring capability, we have constraint, and we have process that sensor utilize. We have devices, can be physical device, and related to the, the part of the system. And also syst, uh, sensor is a part of platform, can deploy something. Operating restriction, so sensors can deploy something in certain area. Okay, these semantic, this is this uh, semantic sensor network ontology, this is the uh, actually, uh, getting from, uh, if you could read the papers, which Dr. Atad, this is from the one of the papers, uh, from where page, page three has get taken. This article, the Semantic Sensor Network Ontology of the World Wide Web Consortium Semantic Sensor Network in the uh, Kevator Group. So this article described the Semantic Sensor Network Ontology. Uh, the Semantic Sensor, the Semantic, uh, Sensor Network Incubator Group produced an OL2 ontology to describe the sensor, to describe the sensors and observation. You can see here sensor, observation, and certain the, set, uh, the central importance of the sensors is observation and properties brought out by the uh, semantic semantic sensor observation ontology design uh, pattern. The, sem uh, the semantic sensor network ontology describes sensors in terms of capabilities, measurement, process, observation, deployment, and so on. This is the sample of weather stations. So this is uh, not very readable, I believe, for you, but you can see that in this side, how describe the temperature, we have maximum, we have minimum. Sensors are here. We have different sensors here. So this is the 
one actually RDF model. And here, a semantic annotation of sensor web enablement. You can see here, you can see here a link. So here, element, or let's say data element, is connecting to the ontology. Uh, these are, this is adoption of semantic sensor network. So you can see here a number of projects which already use this framework. A lot of data has collected from weather sensors and published as an open link data. Link open data. Link sensor data. Approximately 2 billion triples has been collected. So you can see device location connected to the geo name. And here is the, the big circle. You can see sensor data by the noises. Sorry, sensors data set. This is the RTF uh, description of approximately 20,000 weather stations in the United States. And here you can see this sensor weather station is linking to the geo name. And here also is the different type of description, RTF description of Hurricane and blizzard observation. You can see here the, the name of the event, the type of the event. So here the range of the data, number of the circles, and number of the observation, which always is less than the number of circles. So observation type can be temperature, pressure, wind speed, and uh, humidity, and so on. This is a linked data set. So we have variety of observation here. Let's say sensor and location. Here in this part, you can see approximately two billion circles from the middle west. So here, the sensors are approximately uh, 20,000 plus and location 230 plus always by having less Sensors, by having less amount of sensors, it's much easier for humans to uh, analyze the data, to make sense, and uh, bring it to meaningful to use, actually. Sensor discovery application. So, okay, this is one of the examples which, uh, by query, you can type the name. Uh, in case, if you want to see here, so, you uh, can see I, the name. I want to know who, did, who looked at this demo. Is there? Online. Okay. Why not? This is the, you know, there are all these, you know, very good demos. I asked, suggested you that uh, you uh, go through the web page and all kinds of demos and other things like that. Again, I need to get back to you as to the original, you know, discussion we had. What this class is about. Not, not here to sit passively. Okay, um, Shiva, did you look at these slides before? Okay, uh, I, you know, th this is. This is important. Uh, so uh, let me go through. Did you see, see the slides before? The slides, yeah. Yeah. Maybe. Did you see the slides before? No, I saw the paper. Well, the slides were posted, right? In the Google community to see, right? What was that for? Did you see the yeah. slides? Did you see the slides? Did you see the slides before? No. I got through the video. But the slides are there. What are they for? It clearly says we do it. Yeah. Shiva, you did? You did you no, know? I didn't know. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I think I like the same. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
who did not read the chapter and did not see the slides. So everybody read the chapter at least? So tell me what happens then. Uh, let's see. Uh, Matthew. So what happens? Uh, what, what, what is this you know, about if you saw the chapter? I did not read the chapter either. Oh, you didn't see the chapter, you didn't see the presentation? I no. don't see the slides on uh, Google Plus. No? What's that? Okay. Is this on Google Plus, right? I don't think it is. No. The original, yeah. Yeah, the, the, web three three the original slides are on Google Plus. The modified slides we haven't posted yet. Um, well, and this is not a part of the original slide? No, it is more than that. There is yeah, more than that. Yeah. Right, so but it's not like, like you didn't post it like here's what's going on for next week and you had to go no. look back. It's not. Yeah. It's not. Uh, it, I had said two presentations. Oh, okay, those it are the two reading materials. Right. Yeah. 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 I see. James M. Post Dayton Airport, International Airport. So, go back. Here, as soon as you type this information, this is a name, so the system will map it to the particular area. Here. Mm, show it to must be much more, much more specific there, right? There is basically a database of all the um, sensors and um, here, uh, the uh, what it has to do is to find uh, the nearest sensor to the location you mentioned. Yes, I want to continue to tell you. So uh, yes, first of all, he will select a particular location and show it on the map. Allows you to get access to the nearby the data, either can be uh, in real time or his historically. And you can see here giving other information as well, like wind speed, visibility, and uh, humidity, and so on. Here is the interpretation or ab uh, abstraction or explanation of sensor data. So here, uh, noise is uh, using a symbol which is more useful than numbers. You can see symbols are more meaningful than numbers. So here, what happens? Converting the data into the abstraction, to something meaningful to the human. Let's say now outside it's raining. We have examples of this uh, on a slide. So uh, let's say, for example, outside is raining, or we would like to know uh, when we are go out, we need umbrella or we don't need umbrella. So through the numbers, in case if you see temperature number, it's really difficult to see after one hour uh, what happen, what's happening. So either it's uh, snowing, you should go out, you should not go out. But by this symbol, it's very much, much easier that you guess that, okay, if it's, uh, it's cold, but it uh, can be rain or it's, it cannot be rain. Raining or snowing. Here are uh, application of semantic sensor Semantic sensor and network. So that's for weather, rescue, and the symbol of healthcare. Here you can see uh, the idea here is to show that you can see a number of observations is always much more than uh, relevant abstraction. So by having a less amount of number, like the sensors have always a lower amount, so we, uh, the human can uh, bring uh, to decision making. So it can bring actually to make it sense that, okay, it can be easier to analyze. This is what I understood from this slide. Okay, uh, this is a good point. So uh, let's see uh, who could, who would like to add something to this point here. So the first one, the picture talks about the order of matter. Like professor was telling, like we have a couple of sensors, 
one is precipita precipitation, another is uh, temperature, and the then third is wind speed. That is that that stands for P C W. So uh, if we uh, go through the orders matter, in that case, we if we take the pre precipitation first, we can easily identify is it a blizzard or not. We do not have to look for the other two sensors. And in this is one of the case that results in the second image. That is the number of observation that goes a very large, but uh, the abstraction that comes, uh, that is very few. I think the ordering issue is uh, aspect of uh, something called focusing mechanism in what we call semantic perception. Right? So what additional information would help you reach to a better understanding, meaning, uh, that is, you know, that, that you obtain from the data you have. But this slide simply, you know, this stage it can only tell you, it doesn't talk about ordering or anything, it simply tells you that, look, the, the sensors generate all this data, mm -hmm. but uh, if you can map that data into uh, the things that humans will talk about and think about and act upon, <coughs> that it is too cold today, that it is very raining today, too cold, I should wear a jacket, raining, I could take a umbrella or raincoat. These kind of abstractions that are, right, and often some of them are, um, you know, at the level of uh, a combination of the things. Mm -hmm. For example, sometimes it's cold work plus humidity or cold minus humidity, you have different decisions to be made. So the point simply is that the data is too much, but the action information or the abstractions that allow you to uh, make decisions uh, are far fewer. And that uh, you, in, a, in, in an intelligence system, you need to be able to convert this data into this uh, information, you know, action information. Yeah. Okay, semantics <coughs> empowered dispute <coughs> environment. So here is a mobile phone which uh, will monitor different sensors. So this uh, system has uh, for detection the fire and will say that which kind of fire actually we have. So we keep this uh, system keep this mobile phone close to the somewhere uh, close to fire, let's say. And by having different sensors, uh, let's say temperature, and um, it can decide what kind of fire. Let's say we have different kind of fire. Actually, we have uh, danger fire, we have candle fire, we have uh, the fire which contain chemical things like uh, nitrogen, mono uh, monoxide carbo uh, carbon. So like this, it can say that uh, okay, what is this fire? Is it uh, danger or not? This is another application, a uh, mobile app to help reduce readmission of patient with chronic heart failure. So actually, uh, United States has uh, what I uh, understood from their previous uh, information, uh, United States had uh, problem with the cost of the admission, approximately 17 million plus, or maybe uh, approximately 17 billion, sorry, 17 billion, and... Uh, 17 billion is the cost of the healthcare system because of the readmission of... Uh, no. Yeah, so uh, they had a, they face a lot of cost because of readmission, and this application is uh, reducing that. How? It's going to get your collect your data, so it can collect by by scaling your weights or uh, blood pressure, let's say heart rate, uh, maybe pulse. So when it collect your data, it has a knowledge background and also ontology to the cardiology. So by having this information, can guess that what how how much you have a uh, risk level. So by this application. Not only we reduce the cost of readmission, but also we improve the human health as well. In the next century, planet Earth will don an electronic skin. It will use the internet as a scaffold to support the transmit uh, its sensations. This skin is already being stitched together. It uh, consists a million of embedded electronic measuring devices. So, as you can see, 1999, uh, Neil Gross has said this sentence, and uh, nowadays it's happening already.
In case if you like to uh, know more about these projects, Semantic Sensor Web, please uh, have a look at the Noises or website, Noises.org, and we have more project related topics. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so it defines all of the sensor events and observations and things. Are, are, are we saying that manufacturers have to build to that, which I didn't think was the key? No, so no, how, do you cor how do you correlate that? How do you get the raw data into this annotated format? That's what I'm missing on a connection there. So the sensors will produce the data the way they do. Okay, right. Although majority of the se or many <coughs> sensors have some form of XML representation or tab limited uh, you know, <coughs> format and such. The semantic sensor network in ontology is all about how do you um, make, uh, how do you support semantic interoperability of sensor data. Mm -hmm. So um, when a data is generated by one sensor versus data is generated by another sensor, there are many issues to, uh, you know, that, that you may have to look, uh, look, look after. For example, Let's say there are two sensors, but they, and they are for the same modality. They both measure temperature. But one sensor may have more tolerance than another sensor. So for some application, it's important to know. For example, um, one uh, sensor device used in healthcare is um, uh, FDA approved, another is not. Both may be uh, measuring blood pressure, but one is approved, but there is not. How very, so in the sensor ontology, among many, many other things, you'll be describing such things mm -hmm. as to, um, you know, uh, you'll be describing things about sensor. You'll be describing uh, things about a sensor being part of a physical subsystem. Mm -hmm. You'll be describing uh, things about uh, the, um, The, the sensor ontology itself does not uh, necessarily describe the domain attributes, but the annotation framework would allow you to say, oh, here's the sensor data. This is a, an observation. And what, what constitutes an observation is described in sensor ontology. That observation is about temperature and what constitutes, what, what, what is the meaning of temperature, let's say in the context of a human deciding it to be cold or hot, versus Let's say temperature used for purpose of uh, you know people who drive in um, uh, Alaska in such extreme cold that uh, oil can freeze and they have to worry about different aspects of you know they are interested in sensor as it affects the um, uh, vehicular vehicular operations. So the those kind of you know those contexts. Uh, the different context has to be captured in the ontology. The ontology is about, uh, you know, a temperature as it, it means something to humans versus <coughs> temperature as it means something to, you know, uh, automobile operations, right? So, uh, fundamentally, starting with the raw data coming through the sensor all the way to um, sensor data being meaningful for an application for an, an application being able to uh, understand sensor data coming from multiple sources and use it uh, in its uh, you know application logic, that whole thing gap is being filled by use of these ontologies. The core ontology, uh, so-called domain-independent ontology, uh, uh, is the sensor semantic sensor networking ontology, which is all about the describing the sensors, all about describing the sensor-generated data. The core, or the, the, and then that has to be complemented by domain-specific ontologies, uh, like what is the temperature, like what is the location, because different sensors have, you know, would give you different modality, different types of data, and they will be describing domain-specific ontologies, and that will all both suppose you are talking about these two ontologies. In some cases, you have multiple ontologies, multiple domain ontologies. The data may have spatial element, temporal element, <laughs> all kinds of stuff. So, uh, but even if you let's say have two, then when you do annotations of the data that is coming from the physical sensor, you're doing annotations with regards to uh, both these ontologies. The specific mechanism, technical, um, you know, uh, for you know, formatting aspects of doing annotation, whether you're using RDFA 
a rotation or whether you are using X-Link. X-Link uh, is a you know, way to, uh, you know, uh, is, an accept, is a standard of how do you, you know, link this particular element to something else, right? So, uh, suppose your XML based data document, you would use X-Link to, you know, uh, link it to something else that is more meaningful as an example. So the meaningful thing would be the concept described in the ontology and for you to say that this particular thing here in the from a physical sensor observation has is that something is is what is described by the concept in ontology is done through this orientation framework. One of the possibility possible orientation framework is X link, but it could be RDFA, it could be something else, right? And uh, it could be micro format. Right? Somebody has to create. It could be micro data. Sorry, but somebody has to create the ontology separately from when you get the sensor data, right? So somebody's going to create that beforehand using some sort of human knowledge, probably, to to say whether a wave is a tsunami. <coughs> Those rules have to be written independently of the stuff we presented here that reads the sensor data. Right. So sensor data, first of all, this core enclosure sensor, uh, you know, that is applicable throughout. Okay. But in the context of tsunami or earthquake or whatever other things are, though there will be these are what you would call examples of domain ontologies for different domains, and those are yes indeed developed separately. In fact, often they are developed for purpose altogether uh, different than the sensor itself. There is no um, you know the concept of temperature doesn't necessarily imply that there is a sensor per se or thermometer. Right. It may, it may not be. If some whatever way you got, uh, you know, it may be that um, uh, you are uh, going or uh, using a mobile phone, um, uh, going, uh, um, uh, getting the temperature, and then manually, uh, you know, providing the temperature to the application, and that application now uses ontology to understand that what the temperature implies. So, you know, these things can be, uh, they, you know, the. Domain semantics exists as they do in human activities, in human mind, in our uh, you know um, understanding of the world and ourselves. So that they exist. Semantic sensor networking ontology exists um, and is now being widely adapted for core as a core ontology whenever you deploy any sensor data. And um, um, uh, the whole idea is that. Um, while there are, there are different manufacturers, there are different sensors, they continue to generate their data, these mechanisms, these things that you saw in semantic sensor networking and semantic sensor web are, allow you to take the world of sensor data observations as they exist into the world where you can effectively develop semantic applications. So my question is low level, where the annotation is occurring. Mm. So the sensor mechanism, the machine, is producing some raw data in some sort, in some format. There's some mechanism that has to annotate that raw data to get it into this, you know, ontological. So the sensor, the SSN, defines the high level to say, okay, what kind of sensor it is. So somebody's got to say, oh, this is sensor one, this is sensor two, they're different manufacturers and all that. Somebody defines that somewhere. And yes. then that gets annotated by some service that listens yes. to the sensors. Yes. That? And then, so I guess my question is, so the sensors themselves aren't abstracting their observations. They're still pumping out the raw data. Is that is that mm -hmm. right? So uh, by and large, that is the default sense of operations. Although the expectation and hope is that more and more of uh, uh, activities that is done in the software layer can be pushed down to the firmware level. Um, now let us let me give you a very concrete example. First of all, on annotation, I'll give you one very simple example. Um, you know XML, and in XML you have tag and value. Right, right there, that is the word annotation is too broad, but that is in a way annotation. That tag is annotating that value. Mm -hmm. But that is not a semantic annotation because there is no common interpretation of the tag, uh, you know, that's some mm -hmm. string. Mm -hmm. 
Now what if I do, what if I, I have a namespace based on an ontology? And I would, I would say, I would link the tag to some term in the ontology, saying either it's an equivalent of, is subtype of, is variant of, is one half of what that is, is, um, uh, you know, uh, this is in centigrade and that is in Fahrenheit, is uh, this formula on this to that. So I do that linking and I link to something in ontology. In ontology means you have so called of ontological commitment, which means you have some agreement in terms of common interpretation. Right? So what I ended up doing is that now I elevated what was a syntax, uh, a tag, into something that is meaningful semantic because uh, you linked it to or you referred it by the terms or concepts in the ontology. Right? Now this is how I am so doing it. It can be, there can be, now this is more <coughs> of a direct way, there may be multiple levels possible. And I could have two things. One is that I said there is a uh, value, it is integer, and it is, um, uh, you know, th that is described by, let's say, uh, a core sensor ontology. And yet that integer is actually a temperature that is described by, uh, um, uh, you know, domain specific ontology. So on this tag, I could have more than one annotations. That gives me full meaning. Right? Now, um, beyond going from that, from from this original thing, uh, where original thing, you know, the current thing as may exist is, um, let's say, um, so uh, what uh, sensor uh, enablement uh, sense, uh, SWE sensor web enablement framework of OGCD was to recognize that there is all these heterogeneous sensors and they did not go as far as the semantic sensor networking and proji did. But they basically said, I want to uh, um, be, I want to have the sensors uh, data interoperable, not semantic interoperability, but data interoperability. So what they did was to say, they define XML based syntax. The language is that Steve presented those four things that he had, right? Those languages are primarily XML based, but they use limited vocabulary for the tag names. And they are defined and they are cast in concrete. So if you want, so the idea then was that uh, while the sensor could be producing data in any format, they wanted to, the standard, uh, describe and push uh, the sensors to describe the data or sensor manufacturers to describe the data in XML based format. Now once you have XML, then it is easy to talk about web services. It is a data interoperable level. Again, uh, the, the, there is typically no concept there uh, of domain ontology, as that would be with the semantic sensor web framework. So what we did in the semantic sensor networking was to take SWE's thing at a semantic level. And yet we also define the way to coexist with them, because some people may have already gone that path and we want to coexist with them. So the same source that was talked about earlier is a semantic layer in the semantic sensor web, uh, you know, work that we did uh, well before semantic sensor networking was, and in fact the work we did actually, uh, you know, uh, uh, to some extent, and some other people also were working on a similar area, but that significantly drove what happened in early part of semantic sensor networking meeting. There will be meeting 20 people on the call discussing week after week uh, on different matters. So we, have, we were able to show all this example like SEMSOS and all that. And those I got, you know, somehow they, they draw, uh, they gave the concepts necessary for early part of the development and then more things were developed as we went along. So making things meaningful is not that easy in trivial. But you basically have uh, two broad classes of options. Either you deal with the semantics when you write the application program, and hence you are applying the semantics that is in the brain of the software engineer. He may refer to something or she may refer to something and use the terms appropriately, but there is no guarantee and uh, uh, some data goes in and some program does something. Or you capture the agreements in this formal or semi-formal or structured form. 
as a taxonomy, as a uh, RDFS, RDF ontology, as in OWL ontology, they, you know, they, 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 are, uh, dif they, are, they have different level of expressiveness. Independent, and then everybody, and then data gets annotated. And then you're not simply limited by, uh, uh, you know, the interpretation by, of a single programmer who writes the program to interpret the data that sensor produces. Right? And of course, uh, you know, in, in the world, time and again, you find that um, uh, very often these kind of frameworks where uh, uh, you have to do more upfront work, don't succeed, uh, at least don't succeed in, a, in short term. Think about it. Um, on one hand, you have um, um, a hacker, a guy, uh, you know, a good developer, you tell him or her, here's a sensor data, and you say what you want, and you get an application working. Versus all the fault it takes to use ontologies, which ontology is the right one, get the data annotated, all kinds of layers of things that happen also. One where you hard code everything in your program, you're out very fast. Other, you have all these different things to follow, you have to understand it, and so on and so forth. And uh, there is um, um, naturally uh, resistance, and there's naturally a lot of cost. Suppose a company has to make a decision, and you tell the company that, um, I will give you software for ten thousand dollar versus uh, this, this other soft, uh, If I go the route of using ontology and semantic thing, it will cost you thirty thousand dollars. Mm -hmm. This guy will say, "Well, my revenue base is only if I spend ten thousand, I'm going to make only uh, fifteen thousand. I'm not going to spend thirty thousand. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, uh, so so you know, the, it may not make business sense to put all this." additional effort and uh, have the uh, programmers train and so on and so forth. Or uh, people say, well, I'm taking risk. Uh, not many people are yet using ontology. Why should I spend the investment like that, right? So that is also a challenge that uh, uh, you face. And that is why it takes a long time. Other thing is that, um, you know, um, uh, there are very few people who are willing to take risk and be upfront, in a, you know, particularly in, in the industry. And so when I did Tali, and you know, I'm talking about 1999, 2000, 2001, we are way too high. Right? So I would go, I remember I would go and I had meeting with um, you know, some CTO of major companies. Um, and uh, you know, I, would, you know I, I remember going and meeting uh, the Yahoo CTO, chief scientist, I remember meeting uh, uh, CTOs and uh, CIOs of major corporations, and they said, "But there is this other big company, Google. They are not using it. Why are you know why why would I take risk with you? We are a smaller company. They had 25 million investment. I had 2.4 million investment. Right? So so uh, uh, you, you know um, it was too early, right? And there was not what you call critical mass." Right? So I had, you know, um, now um, you either see Google using this knowledge graph, which is, you know, an ontology of sorts, um, or at least background knowledge base, or you have the schema.org, right? Uh, uh, did you guys see the uh, uh, Guha's uh, article. talk, the article, yeah? And um, uh, look at the adoption. I think he said 40% of all the web pages, uh, the crawling, are uh, annotated with schema. That is massive. There will be more and, mom and pop, uh, you know, pages that you know, created pages that would not be uh, schema or so what. But all you know, a lot of that practically means all the people that matter are already annotating with schema mm -hmm. So uh, now that is a done deal. What is a schema or Right? It gives you. It's an ontology of sorts. Yeah. And another important thing Guha also says is extensibility. I made a point, I made the point in my post, right? Yeah. So I want to see uh, what our web team does with regards to the use of you know, extensibility for the things. You should talk to Sanjay and make sure you figure that out. But uh, so, so now it's pretty broadly. 
I remember a lot of other things. So I, we did this thing, okay, 2000 was too early. After that, during the 2000s, uh, 2005 time frame, uh, we used to do a lot of work with micro formats and micro data. They were also a way to annotate. Metadata, semantic annotation, metadata, semantic tagging, these are all same thing, right? So we were metadata, uh, microdata, or micro formats were the ways to annotate uh, data. And there's a lot of discussions about how to do that. Do that. And uh, there was some use. In particular, there was uh, use in the context of RESTful web services. You suppose you, are, you have a REST service and gives you, you are you're getting the data, you're getting some XML or DOM tree. And uh, you really have to understand what that means. You know, programmer spends time. The guy, guy who's writing interpret data on the browser side has to figure that out what those things mean and interpret correctly. Otherwise, it will have unintended operations, right? I mean, with things. Uh, and everybody will invest their time in that. So the micro data or micro format provided some additional you know, value in making the things uh, more meaningful. Not, so it is, they wanted to take small step, not big gap step. And then it so happens sometimes uh, things just fall in place. That schema.org started with rather small sets of concepts, very simple. Um, there, was a, there, is, there is a widely um, um, uh, under, uh, you know, um, use library science based um, uh, what you call ontology, uh, what is it called? Um, uh, I don't know, they, they basically describe uh, digital uh, uh, documents. They just describe documents and they have you know, publisher, the author, copyright, all this kind of basic vocabulary they have come up with. Right? They have about 25 properties or attributes. Right? That's widely used in the context of lib annotating library materials. Right? Uh, now, uh, these guys in Schema.org started with something basic and built upon that. So one thing is they started with really, really small things that is broad, broadly applicable, but shallow thing. So that the initial investment is low. right? Uh, and yet some value is there. Uh, what worked for them is several things. Uh, you know, uh, how, why some technologies and some standards work and others don't. And this is a very good example. A, um, uh, it worked because it was a little simple to use. B, it worked because it, they were not the first one to do it. It has been, you know, semantic web goes a long time ago. Uh, you saw my blog and other things I shared. And others also had worked on it. C, the right people got involved. Actually, with first C, uh, they uh, they figured out a way uh, to say to the public that there is um, the value of this with regards to the most important application on the web, which is what is the most important application on the web? The most not important. not counting the mail. Facebook search. <laughs> you more than uh, Facebook, but search, search right? is a uh, 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 hugely important application, right? So everybody, and everybody would be interested to have their web pages and data come up for uh, the search results, right? So, so they, they, they showed the value to extremely important thing, and then um, uh, multiple search providers uh, decide to partner and not fight. So Yahoo and Bing and, uh, uh, and Google are partnering there, right? So, so they basically, you know, all these different things fell together for schema or to succeed, right? All right. Sorry, sir. Huh. I'm just continuing with the same thread as you talked about the raw data hmm. with the W, uh, SWE. So, so annotation uh, allows you to interpret or have a meaning mm -hmm. associated with the data. Yeah. Then, again, the ultimately applications have to process the data. Okay, the I mean, this application you show where you type, uh, uh, you know, uh, James Cox, uh, you know, 
Dayton Airport. Dayton uh, International yeah. Airport. There, uh, the somewhere in some database exists with that name, uh, the coordinates ex to exactly where it is, right? Uh, so there is it's a geo name. So there is a, in linked open data, one of the cluster uh, you know bubble in the linked open data is something called geo name. So names of millions of entities in the world are in there. Originally, some people in data you know manually said this particular is, thing is at this location, right? This um, I, I when I went to uh, Google Map. And I, uh, uh, you know, in the Google map, I said, Noesis is at this location. I show it on the map in the building, right? That has, uh, uh, that allows Google map to create uh, coordinates. That means now Google map knows the string, Noes, K -N -O dot E dot S I S has this coordinates. coordinates plus they also have the knowledge that uh, this building is Joshi Research Center. And it's spelled Joshi yes. Research Center. All this data is coming together, right? So it's in database of some sorts, right? This kind of stuff is in GeoName. So when you type that uh, airport, it looks up coordinates, and then um, uh, it looks uh, uh, at uh, database of all the sensors and asks the query. Does the query give me the G closest uh, uh, sensor? And uh, the, it shows, and it so happens that there is a sensor on the airport premises, mm -hmm. a sensor pod, not single sensor, so no multiple sensors are there. Mm -hmm. So that sensor is um, uh, 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 also online, okay. right? And that sensor is also using um, uh, um, uh, web, web service to make the data available, okay. which means it is, I don't know exactly whether they use SWE or not, but they are equivalent to that. So uh, it is available as a service. That means I can make a call to the service, mm -hmm. and I get the data, and I can display the data. So this application has done all these different things. It has used, um, uh, you know, the uh, geo names. It has done the query against the sensor databases. It has uh, called the service, and it has dis 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 displayed data. Additionally, it may also do the following thing that you may or may not see: is that it understands, uh, for example, it does simulating annotation of the data which is not necessary just to display the temperature element. That can be done because in XML, I can clearly have my application, you know, display the, you know, put a tag temperature equal to this thing and so on and so forth, and I can create a snippet, like Google Snippet or whatever it is. I can build that easily, right? Or Yahoo Snippet. But I want to make it more meaningful, suppose, because I want to uh, uh, use, so this is a, uh, just a part of a broader application we have built on which we can uh, do, uh, there's another application if you go online, uh, there, if you saw in that thing, there's an application which does real-time feature streaming application. So in that application what happens is that you go there and that application is, uh, uh, you can say uh, in the geographical area of your interest like Ohio, tell me about significant weather phenomena happening now. And there's some predefined type of weather phenomena that are conceptually defined. Weather phenomena like uh, 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 blizzard. So blizzard is defined as um, uh, uh, wind speed over 25 miles per hour. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, speed, speed speed at which uh, you know precipitation over half uh, an inch per hour, and uh, speed uh, of uh, no speed uh, this thing uh, and and visibility uh, of less than some one mile per hour uh, or something like that. Okay. Uh, now that. What happens is that that is then described as a bunch of rules on the weather ontology. So we have ontology, which are concepts like temperature and visibility and all that. And then we specify the rules. The ones that I just like, just said three rules, right? Those rules are specified in different languages. There's a language called SWOL, uh, you know, uh, so, uh, that uh, for defined rules in all ontologies. Another language called RIF, uh, rule interchange format. Uh, designed by W3C and so on and so forth. So you describe them, and then what happens is that this uh, multiple sensor data is coming in, and I'm processing with regards to uh, this uh, description of uh, all the, you know, I just mentioned blizzard, but similarly something defines uh, heavy rain, something defines uh, 
um, uh, uh, you know, some uh, dangerous road condition or whatever, winter road, winter road condition or something. So these are my weather events and the data that is coming in, uh, now in this case, this application monitors the data from uh, the, there are 20,000 weather sensors on the web and uh, constantly giving the data. So they are accessible as a web service. So we would process that and uh, uh, give you, uh, you know, icon on the map if that particular type of uh, weather phenomenon is happening. So you can see, you know, in real time that that stuff is happening. So all of these things come together, right? Now that kind of application would be very, very hard to develop without having the semantic of, uh, infrastructure. Because there are so many other th this, you know, differences to take care of, more heterogeneity. Now, when you have very large scale of existing databases, large scale of existing sensors, many, many providers of sensors, many different ways their data is represented, now it becomes, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, in, now there's enough value in investing in semantic infrastructure, semantic approach to doing it, uh, and, uh, and then you, you know, rather than building a single application, right? So these are the... Now uh, imagine the same kind of application we develop, I, would, uh, I could develop that based on, uh, for, uh, for, uh, um, uh, uh, for monitoring human health. Today, different sensors are coming, right? And uh, all these things, uh, you know, uh, smart watches and Fitbit and everything has a lot of things built in, right? Uh, uh, imagine you buy one of them and the sensors that are already built in your um, uh, your mobile phone. Collectively, I get a lot of data. Right? I can, in theory, uh, say, let's say sensor to predict um, that somebody has uh, developed Ebola symptom can be had for a matter of few dollars. I'm talking about one, two, three, four, five, six dollars in future, in the right time. Okay, it's not that expensive. If temperature aspect, uh, you know, sweating or other things, whatever they're going to monitor, right? As if not hundred percent. Now there's so much work going on in uh, all this developing development of biomarkers. So there is a um, there is a uh, there is an area of uh, work. Uh, what is it called? Uh, uh, genomic proteomics. Um, uh, Glycomics and uh, what is the one that starts with N? Uh, so, so they, that is about uh, you know. Uh, uh, for example, I will take any body fluid. Uh, so first, blood is for sure, but then you may have uh, urine, you may have uh, sweat, mm -hmm. and other things. And uh, they have chemicals, and um, people are developing biomarkers for the so those chemicals. Uh, uh, are you know basically give indications of either some disease or pos possibility of disease or so on and so forth. Now these sensors are not going to be too expensive in the in, in future, and so I could make uh, the sensors and uh, you know I could be monitoring and um, I could monitor the very population scale also if I want to. Right? These are the things that will become possible, and for developing such things on larger scale, not single mobile phone, but one that depends on so much data coming from. Many different sources. Again, this what you are seeing here will become very important. Are you talking about proteomics? No, no. Uh, uh, metabolomics. Hmm? Metabolomics. Metabolomics. Okay. So, so. Um, uh, uh, and so there will be sensors of all that kind. So there's the sensors now that are around us, sensor on us, and sensors people are increasingly within us, right? So there is a in ingestible appeal kind of thing, which has a camera and basically gives you the video of the entire human, you know, system, uh, GI system. And it does not have any, you know, all of these things that, uh, for example, uh, uncom you know, comf un you won't be uncomfortable as you might be, let's say, with any intravenous thing or colonoscopy or whatever you do. Right? So these are the um, you know, things that are happening, but the growth of the, all the kind of sensors there is um, massive. Now here's an interesting point. By and large, uh, at least in the press, I, you see a lot more discussion about Internet of Things, is sensor around us. But really, a lot more valuable would be the sensors that deal with human conditions. 
that will be on us and within us and all that stuff. A lot more value, right? So I, I, I you know, people, you, from a business perspective also, people will be willing to spend a lot more money in, um, you know, something that directly affects their health and happiness and, uh, you know, entertainment as opposed to other, you know, things. So this will be more like aspirin versus vitamin. As in business, when you go, the thing, are you, do you have an aspirin or you have vitamin? Um, and the, the argument is that uh, if you are making aspirin, somebody has headache, he needs it. Mm. But one does not know when one really has to have vitamin. That's nice to have. Yeah. And you don't take vitamin for a day or two or three, it's okay. Mm. Nobody knows what will happen. Right? Mm. But you, 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 when you have headache, you, must, you have to have pain killer. So, so that's certainly the idea. All right, what next? We can stop that here.